Okay, so we'll finish off the actions today. And then we might get to the phytochemical stuff. And there's a note I uploaded uh, last night or yesterday, so you can get access to that. Um, so let's get started on the cardiovascular system. Okay, so the cardiovascular system is an area that kind of overlaps with diet and herbal medicine. And so I would say that I've treated um, lots of people, numerous people for things like high cholesterol um, and blood pressure. So those are things that a lot of people uh, suffer from. And uh, I think we have some good tools in our kit that we can use to help people with this. Um, when it comes to cardiovascular disease, obviously the most important thing is going to be diet and exercise. Uh, a diet rich in fruits and vegetables will have lots of antioxidants and lots of compounds that have an anti-inflammatory effect. And that's very, very important. Uh, another important thing is to not eat a lot of refined sugar. Sugar, uh, I just read a report that uh, was published in JAMA in the fall that basically said that the sugar industry uh, funded a whole bunch of research in the, I guess maybe it was the 80s, to basically point uh, the smoking gun at uh, saturated fat as being the cause of heart disease. Meanwhile, uh, sugar and refined sugar is one of the worst things for the cardiovascular system and for heart disease. So. Uh, fats aren't as bad as, well, there are good fats and bad fats, but they're not as bad as we once thought. It appears to be that sugar is one of the more important things uh, that uh, is very hard on the cardiovascular system. Um, and then finally, exercise, in particular, uh, doing cardiovascular uh, types of ex exercise. Um, anything that increases your heart rate is going to be really good for your for your blood pressure and stress and cholesterol. So, um, when we're talking about the cardiovascular system in general, there's a number of <clears throat> actions that are kind of unique for it. Um, the first one that we'll start with is a cardiotonic. So, this is sort of a vague uh, term, kind of like a bitter tonic, uh, might be just something that tonifies the digestive tract. A cardiotonic is something that tonifies and makes the heart work better. And so this would be for people who are suffering from congestive heart failure, or let's say if they had some swelling in their ankles or a little bit of edema, but it wasn't full-blown congestive heart failure, and you wanna get the heart just moving uh, better, or maybe supported by taking things that have a, an affinity for the heart that maybe have some antioxidant uh, ability. So in general, um, most of the herbs that are specifically used as a cardiotonic have some sort of effect on the heart where they tend to increase the force of heart of the uh, of the stroke and uh, decrease the rate to some degree. And herbs like hawthorn, motherwort are two classic herbs uh, that I've used quite a bit. Hawthorn in particular has a lot of good research that shows that it has benefit for mild to moderate congestive heart failure. I would certainly consider using that in those patients. With people who have a more moderate to severe um, congestive heart failure, you would have to use something stronger. Um, historically, herbs like foxglove, sort of digitalis, was used as a herb, but also as a drug, uh, as in uh, dig digoxin. Uh, and lily of the valley is another one that's a milder form of, uh, it works a little bit like Fox Club, but it's a little bit milder and it's called the cardiac glycoside. And uh, we'll talk about them more in a second. Now, some of the adaptogens, just as an aside, you'll notice that <clears throat> when you look at the traditional indications for certain adaptogens like astragalus and ginseng, um, from a Chinese perspective, uh, often when people have like a kidney yang deficiency, uh, you'll learn this in TCM one of the presentations they'll get swelling in the ankles, for example, and 
low libido and fatigue. And although that presentation can be associated with, with let's say, s stress and, and low sex drive and, and old age, um, it can also be associated with sort of a mild congestive heart failure. And what's interesting, when you look at the structure of the active compounds in ginseng, which are the ginsenosides we'll talk about later on, um, or the compounds in astragalus, um, these compounds are steroid-like in structure, uh, and they look a lot like you'll see uh, the same types of compounds like digoxin you'll find in digital. So although they're not nearly as strong and they're very, very safe, they do have a slight tonifying effect on the heart. So I just think that's kind of neat that um, these are, uh, I would say these are, a lot of the adaptogens have potential to work on, on the cardiovascular system. Um, now, Hawthorne, which is shown on the left, this grows wild around North America. Uh, where my parents live, it's one of the common shrubs, it's a low tree, um, and typically the flower, the leaf, and the berry is used, and it's very gentle. I've made jellies with the jam, uh, and I've consumed a lot of it, and it just, you can feel it slowing the heart rate down, but it's pretty to uh, pretty safe, it's not toxic, you're not going to overdose and die from this, uh, or at least I think it would take an awful lot to get, th to, get to that state. The main active ingredients um, are types of flavonoids called um, anthocyanins. We'll talk about them a little bit more later on. And these are pretty safe antioxidants. They have a tonifying effect on the heart. And um, I've also read some research that shows that they have a protective effect against certain types of chemotherapy. So uh, some chemotherapies that damage the heart, it may offer some protection for that as well. So Hawthorne's safe, gentle herb, someone who has mild to moderate congestive heart failure, they're not taking any other medication. Um, I would consider recommending that. Motherwort is a herb that kind of overlaps with uh, the nervines, so it has a calming effect. It's in the mint family. Um, it's specifically used for, they call it motherwort, so it helps with anxious mothers who might get heart palpitations a little bit, perhaps a bit sexist, but um, so this herb does have some blood pressure lowering effects and does have uh, a tonifying effect. It kind of helps to um, modulate, this, I think, the sympathetic nervous system on some level and just sort of decrease that state of anxiety and slow down the heart rate. Um, now, moving on, um, there are a few other indications that are you could associate with the cardiotonic. Now, these terms you'll find in pharmacology textbooks. The term ionotropic basically means ions is, for example, calcium or sodium ions, and basically uh, what uh, ionotropic means is that it increases the force of contractions of the heart, okay? Uh, so something that's positive ionotropic will basically make the heart beat stronger. So someone who suffers suffers from congestive heart failure where the heart is sort of sluggish and weak and it's and it's just barely pumping, it'll increase the force of contractions. Now something that's negative ionotropic will do the opposite. Obviously this will slow down or decrease the force of contractions. It doesn't slow it down, it just decreases it. So when you have congestive heart failure, the strategy that you want to do is you want to meet make the heart pump stronger and slower because if imagine if you have a uh, some kind of pump and it's just pumping really really rapidly uh, but not really pumping deep it's not going to help move water or blood around as well if something goes strong and forceful contractions so Hawthorne uh, is probably the mildest of the herbs that are classified as positive ionotropic and I would say a lot of the uh, cardiotonics we discussed above um, are going to have this effect to some degree, but we know uh, from research that Hawthorne has that effect. It's considered to be mild, very, very safe. Lily of the Valley I've used only a couple times, and it's a more of a, a moderate uh, positive ionotropic. It does have some toxicity associated with it. You would have to be careful with it. 
but it, still relatively safe. And then foxglove would be something that uh, poses the greatest risks, and it's quite strong, and it's uh, something that has a narrow therapeutic uh, index, which basically means the amount that's safe overlaps with the amount that's toxic, and over time, if you're taking foxglove or digoxin, what can happen is the active ingredient can accumulate in the body and then become toxic. So the initial dose uh, that you start taking for the first few days might be safe, but then maybe after a few weeks or a couple of weeks, or I don't know the exact amount of time, um, the active ingredient will, will start to rise in your body and it could become toxic. So it requires you to monitor the drug levels in, in order to get the right amount. So I've never used foxglove, I probably never will, uh, but Hawthorne and Lily of the Valley I have. And so the way that these guys work is they basically increase the influx of calcium ions into the cytoplasm of the muscle cells, and this uh, controls the force of the contraction of the heart. So foxglove is on the left. Uh, you'll see this in lots of people's gardens. That's a very pretty flower. Uh, Livia the Valley uh, is on the right hand side. Certainly, as a child, I remember it has a beautiful aroma, nice smell to it. Um, you know, as a five year old uh, kid, I remember my sister and her friends would make perfumes out of it. You know, I don't think they're very good perfumes, but um, and but we also knew that it was toxic. So our parents would always say, "Don't eat, don't eat the leaves; they're poisonous." Uh, and you'll see this growing um, in people's gardens, but also in the wild as well. Um, and both those plants um, have a strong association with the heart. Now, another term that uh, I want you to be aware of, and you'll learn about it in probably pharmacology as well, is uh, chronotropic. So chrono means time. So a negative chronotropic tropic means it slows down the heart rate. And so where you'd see this is basically, again, going back to uh, congestive heart failure, when people get arrhythmias and the heart starts beating erratically and too quick, what you want to do is slow it down and make it pump more efficient, efficiently. You want to calm it down. And so something that has a negative chronotropic effect will slow down the heart rate and often it will also have a positive chronotropic, uh, positive ionotropic effect. So it slows down the heart rate and makes it beat more forcefully. So this would be used in people who have congestive heart failure. Uh, arrhythmias, uh, which are also heart palpitations, uh, tachycardia, meaning fast heart rate. So that would be an indication for it. Now, something like, I don't know if I included it in the next slide, no. Something that's a positive chronotropic uh, will be something that increases the heart rate. And an example of this might be something like ephedra or caffeine that stimulates the heart rate. And something that stimulates the heart rate and also makes it beat faster will help to move things around. So if you're wanting to go for a run, uh, having a positive, uh, positive chronotropic effect and a positive ionotropic effect is not a bad thing at all. Uh, if you want to make your heart beat efficiently um, under normal conditions, then you want to slow it down. So again, the herbs that have this negative chronotropic effect will be the heart tonics we described, motherwort definitely has this effect. It's very gentle. It could be used in tea. So uh, a woman who kind of gets heart palpitations uh, is feeling anxious. That's where I would use uh, motherwort. I do also use it in men. I don't mean to just talk about only women. Um, Hawthorne, again, from mild congestive heart failure where you need to make the heart beat uh, more efficiently would be ideal. And then when you start getting into herbs like Lily of the Valley, you got to be a little bit more careful. And then again, foxglove, um, if you don't get the right dose, you can cause harm to someone. Uh, that's just a little research study. I was trying to find some information on, um, on motherwort. And there are some studies that basically describe how it works as a, cardi um, as a, as a cardiotonic. So, in general, I think this sort of helps just to classify how these things work. Something that's basically both a positive chronotropic and a positive ionotropic, meaning it speeds up the heart rate and increases the force of contractions, will be sympathomimetics, so things like ephedra, or the anticholinergics that suppress the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. 
Okay, so you either stimulate the sympathetic nervous system or you suppress the parasympathetic nervous system to increase the force of contractions and increase um, the rate of the heart. Now, heart tonics are similar, but they have a negative chronotropic effect and a positive ionotropic effect. So something like Hawthorne will slow the heart rate down and make it pump more efficiently. I would say the heart tonics are certainly much more, uh, or a lot of them are, very, are a lot safer than the sympathomimetics and the anticholinergics, but then you can also have um, ones that aren't safe as well, like the fox loop. Another herb is you'll see some some herbs classified as an antiarrhythmic. Now, some of these terms get a little bit redundant because a lot of the cardiotonics work on arrhythmia. Now, what an arrhythmia is, is basically something that if someone suffers from an arrhythmia, it basically means A, meaning no, rhythmia or ryth arrhythmic, uh, which means rhythm. So you have got no rhythm. So you're not going lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. You know, that's what your heart's supposed to do. It might be doing lub lub dub dub lub. Dub, dub, dub. Uh, and it might actually sound like that. And certainly my uh, grandfather had uh, uh, a strep infection when he was a kid and he got uh, rheumatic fever that attacked his heart. Uh, and so he still managed to live till I think close to 80, um, actually over 80. And I remember when I was a student, I was listening to his heart and uh, it was just amazing how I couldn't even believe it, it, his heart could even work. Um, uh, because it was just so erratic in the way in his beats and, and uh, so he was on medication for that and so uh, herbs that are antiarrhythmics are basically herbs that help with congestive heart failure so one of the side effects of getting rheumatic fever a strep infection is it attacks the valves of the heart uh, and damages it and then people develop congestive heart failure so um, so you would consider giving someone who suffers from an arrhythmia uh, an antiarrhythmic Herb, which could be the Hawthorne Lily, the Valley, and Fox Love. Again, we've already discussed all that. Um, another term that you'll see in a lot of the books are circulatory stimulants or circulatory tonics. This would basically be anything that kind of helps to stimulate uh, circulation to the um, to the periphery. And so maybe people are getting cold hands and feet, or they've got a lot of stagnation in their ankles and their hands. Uh, maybe um, you're just trying to get things moving around in the body or it may be trying to stimulate blood flow to the uh, to the brain then you might use a, a, sti a circulatory stimulant. I would say things like ephedra and even the cardiotonics are going to also have this action as well um, but there are other herbs that are often called circulatory stimulants that we haven't discussed already Cayenne is a classic herb that um, has been used a long time in uh, herbal medicine to help warm people up and kind of get things moving. And so I'm sure anyone who's had uh, hot and spicy soup will notice that uh, usually feel warmed up afterwards and you might even become a little bit flushed and that's because um, the cayenne can have a, a vasodilating effect and it can kind of increase the heart rate a little bit in a very gentle, positive way. Um, sometimes cayenne is, there's cayenne foot baths uh, sometimes used for people that, if they're coming down with a cold where you could take hot water and then uh, put a few teaspoons of cayenne chili powder in it and um, capsaicin powder and um, that kind of helps to move the circulation and get the blood flowing to your feet uh, because sometimes when people are sitting around or they get stick, uh, uh, sick, the uh, the blood stops. Uh, it doesn't flow as well to the to the hands and feet. So cayenne can be used for that purpose, or it can be sprinkled into your ski boots uh, in the winter time to try to keep your feet warm. Um, so lots of good indications for that. Now, one thing to watch out for when it comes to cayenne is it's the active ingredient is fat soluble, uh, and it can be very irritating. So if you uh, end up rubbing it on your feet or cooking with it or whatever it may be. Make sure you wash your hands with soap and water when you're done, uh, in particular soap, uh, because if you forget and you, let's say if you're a man and you go to the washroom, uh, you're going to regret not washing your hands. Um, or if you rub your eyes, that's going to sting as well. 
the other thing if you're eating spicy food don't forget water does very little to uh, get rid of the, the, the spice or the, the heat uh, mainly because the active ingredient is fat soluble so if you eat spicy food and it's bothering you uh, instead of drinking water uh, drink alcohol um, or some yogurt which has a lot of fat in it or a little bit of olive oil in your mouth that'll all help to pull um, those compounds out of your mouth and, and um, cool them up down. Um, ginger is another herb that acts as a mild circulatory stimulant. Certainly I find it to be very warming. It's, again, both cayenne and ginger are pungent herbs that help to warm the body up. So if you're sitting at your desk all day and you're studying and you're cold, make a cup of ginger tea. Maybe you'll also throw in a little cinnamon. It has some, some um, warming properties as well. And then have some um, you know spicy uh, food for for lunch, and that'll kind of help um, get things moving. Now, obviously, even more important than cayenne and ginger is go to the gym and exercise. That's the best way to kind of improve your circulation and make and warm you up and stimulate thyroid function. But um, there are some herbs that can help with that as well. And then rosemary, the herb, uh, the culinary spice, it's often used in herbal medicine. Uh, as a cerebral circulatory stimulant. Basically, it's believed to help stimulate circulation to uh, to the brain. And so it's sometimes used for people with poor memory or dementia um, to improve cognition. It's very gentle. There's not a lot of research, I don't believe, on it. But when you look at rosemary, it's loaded with a number of antioxidants and anti-inflammatory uh, compounds, including some essential oils. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's benefit. Certainly rosemary is jam-packed with things that help prevent heart disease and cancer and uh, so um, rosemary is good. If you're making green shakes in the morning you can always throw a little pinch of rosemary in there just for added, added health benefits. Uh, there's rosemary growing on the left. It's in the mint family. You can see uh, a lot of the flowers in the mint family. If you go back to the motherwort slide and look at the flowers you'll see they have the same sort of presentation um, the leaf might change might be different this looks more like needles uh, than an actual like a pine needles than an actual um, like a flat leaf that you'll see in peppermint uh, but they're all in the same family and what's common with all the members of the mint family is that they're rich rich in essential oils and certainly rosemary has that property um, it's a beautiful little plant uh, you can grow it around here easily take it outside in the uh, summertime bring it in, in the winter time and you can get it to bloom it's a pretty little flower so just tiny little ones uh, cayenne uh, on the right there are lots of different species of cayenne so just to confuse you and I apologize for this I've included uh, cayenne I've said capsicum this one is frutescence this is one species um, the one that I've included here is capsicum anum they're both different types of hot peppers and I would say from a herbal standpoint it doesn't really matter which one you use they're, they're all going to do the same thing so uh, certainly some of them are more potent than other ones um, but this is just one example uh, of, of chili peppers um, also as a circulatory stimulant sometimes these will be applied topically so with rosemary uh, in herbal medicine Anecdotally, I haven't found any research. You can apply it topically to your scalp to to your scalp to stimulate hair growth. Uh, I do that. I mean, I don't know how well it works, but I do it anyways. Um, mainly because I like essential oils in my shampoo, and if it helps, you know, slow down the hair loss, that's great. Um, really, I'm not too worried about it. Uh, but adding a little rosemary and and uh, tea tree to your shampoo can also help keep certain funguses down and yeast down that can cause uh, dandruff. Um, so rosemary is often used to stimulate uh, blood flow to the scalp. Um, the other thing that you can use cayenne for is again topically because it's a rubefacient. Remember, how, remember that term? Uh, and the rubefacients can stimulate blood flow to the area and that can help with tight muscles and, uh, and pain as well. Now I'm going to check and see if you guys have any questions before moving on because I covered a bunch of stuff already.
So apparently people can't see my slides. Uh, so you can see my face. Well, that's awful. I don't want you want looking at my face. Uh, let me try. Okay, let me see if I can figure this out with a beta. I'm sorry about that. Beta, can you show my screen, please? So are you guys still only able to see my screen or not? How about you, Michael? I know you texted me. Can you see the screen? My screen. Let me just. Can you see my screen now? I can see your desktop. Uh, that's not my desktop. I think that's. Uh, oops. Shoot. That's not my desktop. If you're looking at a Windows desktop, that's not mine. That's. Um, questions? <clears throat> Give me one second. Webcam. Um, so give me one second. Sorry about that. We tested everything, and it was working. So, I can't see my, so what's going on with the screen here? Let's see. Yeah, I don't think you can see my desktop. I think you're seeing, yeah, you can follow along with your slides. I know you can. I'm just going to see if I can get it figured out. Give me two more seconds here.
Okay. Now, can you see my screen? Uh, so, you can see it now? Okay. I believe we got a yes, you can. From Griffin. And Michael, you can see it too. Everyone else out there, you should be able to see anti-hyperlipidemic. We good? I can't type on my screen. Why is that? And you should be able to see my face now. Is that right? Okay. Um, okay, so I figured out why that is. I didn't log. I don't know why it, exactly, but I think it's because I logged in as academics as opposed to logging in as Matt Gowan. I don't know. I need to see things are fiddly. Uh, I've got several different logins. Okay. Uh, can see, okay, so you guys can see my face now and everything. Okay. Uh, someone asked me if I can go back to the beginning and repeat it all. Um, I'm assuming that you guys don't want me to go back to the beginning and start all over again, considering it's been half an hour. Um, yeah, okay. I'm getting some people shouting out no. So uh, we will not go back to the beginning and repeat it. Yes. Okay. So far, uh, a few people are saying no. I, that's kind of what I think as well. Um, okay, so for lowering cholesterol, uh, there are a few different ways that we can lower cholesterol, and there's a few different herbs that can be used to do this. Now, from my experience, I typically don't start with herbs if somebody comes in, comes in with high cholesterol. Um, there are numerous foods that have a mild cholesterol lowering effect and this is one of the little tricks I find with um, with natural medicine is uh, I, I may have used this analogy in the beginning but if uh, I'm going to use it again if you're an archaeologist and you're working on uncovering some ancient tomb uh, you could use a bulldozer and that would be far more effective than using a shovel and I think everyone would agree with that but the difference between a shovel and a bulldozer is a bulldozer is more likely to cause uh, damage to the structure and is more likely to have you know, problems associated with it. Uh, it's faster, um, but uh, not necessarily uh, safer to use. Now, one shovel is, if, you, if it's a big structure, one shovel is not going to do the job. But if you had, let's say, four or five people with the shovel, then you might be able to get the job done as well as the bulldozer, bulldozer does. So when you're looking at natural therapies, uh, they're more like using people with shovels and, and brushes and brooms to try to clean off the structure. And what I mean by that is one herb or food alone may not lower it significantly. You may only get like a 5% drop if you have a little bit of, let's say, fiber in your diet or some blueberries, whatever it may be. But if you're able to combine lots of small effects that are statistically significant, you can have a very clinically significant effect. So if something like a statin drug, which is used to lower cholesterol, if it lowers cholesterol by, let's say, 20%, there are very few natural supplements that can lower cholesterol that much. But if you were able to take five or six different things, like a diet called the portfolio diet that includes some soy, some fiber, some uh, phytosterols, uh, some nuts and seeds, you can have the same uh, cholesterol lowering effects as a drug does. Now, so when it comes to improving people's cholesterol profile, um, I prefer starting with diet than anything else, mainly because specific foods that help to lower cholesterol usually are rich in antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds as well. Now, just to kind of confuse things even more, 
you'll probably learn this at some point, but cholesterol, having high cholesterol levels is associated with heart disease. But lowering cholesterol doesn't always lower the risk of having a heart attack or dying. And so what's interesting about this is some medications, uh, statin drugs are very good. They lower cholesterol and they also lower the risk of dying and they also lower, they also have an anti-inflammatory effect as well. Um, and so they actually have a lot of health benefits, but they do have significant side effects. There are other types of cholesterol lowering medications that although they will lower the bad cholesterol and the triglycerides, um, they don't actually lower the risk of having a heart attack or death. And so what's interesting about this is cholesterol alone isn't the only factor. And it may be that statin drugs that are the main first line drug used to uh, lower cholesterol, it may be that their benefit is not just the fact that they lower cholesterol, but they may be uh, um, decrease inflammation as well. The nice thing about fruits and vegetables is we know that a diet rich in fruits and vegetables and lots and lots of antioxidants and phenolic compounds and uh, anti-inflammatory compounds uh, lowers the risk of dying and cancer and heart disease significantly. So uh, you always want to start with that. Now, <clears throat> going back to the herbs, I usually start, I've got a handout that I go through with people and I usually get them to choose, um, let's say, four or five different foods to incorporate in, into their diet and that would be maybe some nuts and seeds, uh, specific nuts and seeds like almonds or walnuts, combine it with some blueberries, uh, strawberries, um, increase their fiber uh, using something like flax or chia, take uh, increase their omega-3s through uh, eating more flax and chia, maybe taking a fish oil supplement, um, and using olive oil, avoiding the omega-6 fatty acids like uh, sunflower seed oil or corn oil, um, possibly taking uh, a garlic supplement as well. That's kind of the way that I would address it. Now, in addition to that, there are different herbs uh, that can have a cholesterol-lowering effect as well. Now, before I go into the herbs that we're going to discuss, I'll mention that there are certain products on the market uh, like red yeast extract. Um, basically, it works really well for lowering cholesterol, but it contains a statin drug. And I don't know if you're aware, but statin drugs were originally extracted from, I think it was the oyster mushroom or some type of fungus. And these drugs, um, there's a lot of controversy around them. They definitely work for lowering cholesterol. They definitely lower the risk of um, heart disease, uh, and, uh, and death, but they do increase the risk of having some very serious side effects like muscle pain, uh, kidney issues, liver issues. So um, when it comes to the red yeast extract, it essentially contains a statin drug. So in my opinion, if you're just using red yeast extract instead of using a statin drug, you're not really changing your approach to lowering uh, heart disease and, and lowering cholesterol. You're just basically using a natural equivalent of the drug and it has the same risks associated with it. So uh, I don't use that. When it comes to uh, herbs, one of my favorite ones um, is globe artichoke shown on the left hand side. You can eat this as a food. You can also take it as a supplement. It has a modest uh, cholesterol lowering effect. It's rich in antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds. And so I think this is a very safe, natural way to increase the amount of flavonoids and other compounds called flavonolignans um, that have a beneficial effect on lowering cholesterol and uh, decreasing oxidative stress. <clears throat> now, the herb on the right-hand side uh, that looks like little balls of feces, uh, that's a goo lipid. And, um, that's actually a resin from a tree. So it's a tree sap that contains certain compounds that help to inhibit the synthesis of cholesterol. Psyllium husk on the left hand side, it basically is rich in fiber and has, uh, so you can use it for constipation. Um, and uh, most 
types of fiber will have a cholesterol lowering effect as well. I think it just helps to bind up the cholesterol in the stool uh, and help to eliminate it through, um, through the bowels. And then finally garlic, um, various forms of garlic, usually the aged garlic extracts uh, are researched for lowering cholesterol and blood pressure. Uh, it's a more of an oxidized form of garlic. Uh, that's different than if you eat it fresh. Uh, these compounds have been shown to have uh, a significant, not huge, but significant effect on lowering blood pressure and cholesterol and might also help with heart disease. So garlic I like as a supplement uh, for people with high cholesterol because it's very, very safe. Fiber I'm okay using as well. The Google lipids I rarely use it. Glow bar to tube choke I sometimes use it. Uh, also, um, olive oil, if you're cooking with it, it's going to have both a blood pressure lowering effect and also it helps to lower cholesterol and it's safe and it tastes good. Uh, the leaf also has a lot of the properties as well. Now some of the mechanisms uh, that these herbs work by is one thing you might be doing is because cholesterol is excreted in the bile, some of these herbs will stimulate uh, will act as cholagogues and choloretics to increase the production and the release of bile from the body. So you're helping to eliminate the excretion of cholesterol. Uh, the other way that they can work is most of the cholesterol that gets into your bloodstream is not, for the average person anyways, is not coming from the diet. So even if you eat 100 egg yolks a day, it's unlikely to have a major effect on your blood cholesterol. Most people who have high blood cholesterol is because their bodies are being stimulated to make more cholesterol. Now there are some exceptions to that. There are some people that um, have little mutations that, where they absorb a lot of cholesterol from the diet, but assuming you're uh, the average person, um, you can decrease blood cholesterol by targeting an enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase. And that enzyme is basically one of the ones involved with making uh, cholesterol. So if you're eating a diet that's uh, high in uh, sugar and fructose, uh, you're not exercising and doing a number of other things, uh, your cholesterol levels will be stimulated. Um, and so substances like statin drugs and also like Google lipids will target that enzyme and, and decrease the production. Uh, in my opinion, you're better off improving the diet and the lifestyle um, that make the body naturally uh, not be stimulated to make cholesterol. Um, but uh, some people are very have kind of stubborn bodies, or they're just not compliant, and that's one enzyme you might target for that. And then finally, you might also want to do things that bind up the cholesterol. Um, and decrease the resorption of the bile because the bile will have cholesterol in it. And so that's where fiber kind of helps to stimulate bowel movements and help with the elimination of cholesterol. So those are a few different mechanisms uh, how a herb might have an antihyperlipidemic effect or hypolipidemic effect. Um, it basically means lowers cholesterol. In addition, I think more important than just lowering the cholesterol is decreasing inflammation and oxidative stress because cholesterol itself isn't the cause of heart disease. It's when your body has increased inflammation and there's damage to the arteries. Um, and then the cholesterol becomes oxidized. That's when it starts sticking to, uh, to the injured arteries. So there's a few herbs that you can use for that. My first choice would probably be garlic, just because it's safe. Um, Globar artichoke. Uh, Olive oil and psyllium are also, you know, are sort of dietary things. I'd rather go with flax uh, uh, fiber and chia fiber just because it's easier to eat than psyllium. Um, and Google lipids for me would be at the, probably at the bottom. I just want to double check and make sure you guys are still able to see me. Everything's going. Fine. Yep, you guys are good. So, the next herbal action isn't one that I usually choose 
to give to someone. An antithrombotic is basically something that helps reduce the formation of thrombi. So a thrombi is a blood clot. Um, you can have different types of blood clots. You could have uh, an embolism just from, let's say, a, a, a big piece of plaque breaks off an artery and then uh, basically forms a blood clot somewhere in your heart or your brain causing a heart attack or a stroke. Or it could just be because you have increased um, um, clot formation, uh, which is more uh, like when you cut yourself and you're bleeding and you get a blood clot. It could be more likely to relate related to that. So those types of thrombies um, are going to be caused by increased uh, blood clotting. The, the blood becomes thicker, as they say, uh, and increases the risk of having a blood clot. And this is something that uh, is a greater risk, especially in people uh, where you have lots of inflammation going on and you're an AB have some stagnation somewhere. And so anywhere in your body where there's stagnation, it increases the risk of clots forming. And so this isn't just people that smoke and are obese and not take care of themselves. Uh, even people like soccer players are at an increased risk of getting uh, deep vein thrombosis, which is a type of blood clot in the leg. Uh, because what will happen is they'll be at a soccer game kicking each other in the uh, shins and then they get on a long overnight flight where they're not moving around, they're having to sit down for a while and the blood starts to pull up in their feet and because of the injury, because of all getting kicked and banged around, um, there's more clots forming and then they could run the risk of having a deep band thrombosis which then could end up getting a thrombi in the lungs or in the heart or possibly in the brain uh, which could cause death even. So, um, so generally speaking, move around. It's never good to be stagnant, ever. Uh, so make sure you're moving around, make sure you drink lots of water, uh, watch certain medications that could increase your risk like smoking while on the birth control pill. Uh, those were all some factors. Um, now, there are, there's another term called antiplatelet drugs or herbs. An antiplatelet basically uh, are antithrombotic. Both of these help to thin the blood. And so antiplatelet, because your platelet uh, are a type of uh, white blood cells that are involved with forming clots and helping with uh, that sort of mechanism of, of uh, tissue repair, um, there are certain things that help within the blood by targeting the platelets. Um, so a number of herbs are blood thinners. So some drugs like taking baby aspirin a day, uh, or a small aspirin a day can thin the blood um, and other herbs like ginkgo, ginger, willow, garlic, these all contain, I think in research, they all contain some active ingredients that have been shown to thin the blood a bit. I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing to consume ginger and garlic on a daily basis. I don't, even ginkgo, I don't think there's a lot of risks associated with that. but why it's worth mentioning as an antiplatelet or an antithrombotic is if somebody was on medications uh, that were blood thinners like Coumadin or they're already taking aspirin every day or they had a bleeding ulcer, it could be that these herbs could aggravate their condition. And so I wouldn't want to have someone on Warfarin, which is a very potent blood thinner, uh, and then tell them to eat a whole bunch of ginger and, and take a garlic supplement to lower their blood pressure and cholesterol uh, because we could see an increased risk of bleeding and if someone has uncontrolled bleeding it could increase the risk of having uh, like a, hemorrhag a hemorrhagic stroke. So uh, antithrombotics, I think it's nice that ginger and garlic are blood thinners so if you want to reduce the risk of heart disease I think having some of this in your diet is good or a supplement I don't see any issues with that but if someone had uh, a history of um, blood clots uh, chances are they're going to be on a, on a some type of blood thinner and you want to be aware that anything that acts as an antiplatelet and antithrombotic uh, could potentially uh, interfere with that medication and I would say that's a significant it could be a it could cause death I mean I don't I think it would be unlikely to under most circumstances but uh, that's a red flag uh, someone comes in on Coumadin, Warfarin make sure you don't uh, um, start messing around with their supplements and giving them things like this. 
So willow bark is traditionally used <coughs> as a source of salicylic acid, which is structurally very similar to aspirin, which is acetyl salicylic acid. Uh, if someone was taking a product that contained some kind of willow bark extract uh, for arthritis, let's say, and they happen to be on a blood thinner, that could be an issue. Uh, ginkgo or maidenhair tree, uh, tree uh, it has some blood thinning properties as well, uh, so you want to watch that. And at some point, I am assuming, if you take pharmacology or biochemistry, this is sort of the pathway and the various enzymes that are involved with uh, platelet aggregation and stimulating blood clots. And so there's uh, a little cytokine called platelet activation factor that gets released, binds to a receptor, and then increases the production of arachidonic acid, which acts as a basically as a substrate for the COX-1 enzyme to make certain prostaglandins in the body that then are converted by another enzyme called thromboxane synthetase that produces uh, some other cytokines and prostaglandins called thromboxane A2 and this is the thing that kind of stimulates the platelets to start sticking together and forming a blood clot. And so the reason why I'm showing you this slide is just to demonstrate that for example Ginkgo, we know, targets the PAF receptor, uh, platelet ag uh, activating factor receptor. We know that willow bark inhibits COX-1 enzyme, uh, which is also the same enzyme that's involved with um, uh, preventing uh, stomach ulcers. So um, you have a blood thinning and increases the risk of stomach ulcers if you target COX-1. We know that the ginger has been shown to have a blood thinning effect by targeting the uh, thromboxane synthetase enzyme. So I like showing you this just so that you know these herbs we know they have blood thinning properties we have some idea of how they work and I would imagine that if you gave gink, a, a tincture that contained ginkgo willow and ginger or someone was taking all three of them and they were taking a blood thinner that would probably target the greatest risk of having some sort of uh, issue with the with bleeding increased risk of bruising um, mainly because whenever you have uh, some kind of active ingredient or drug targeting different receptors and enzymes in the body, I think there's a greater potential for it to have some sort of synergistic or potentiating effect rather than if all three of these target the same enzyme, it probably would have a cumulative effect. But now because you're targeting different enzymes involved with um, blood clots, uh, I think you know a combination might have greater blood thinning properties. So I just threw a couple of those things in there. I don't know how it's, I don't, it's probably not that important for you guys to know what enzymes these things are targeting. I just, I just like to be able to show you guys that. Now, uh, lowering blood pressure. I've had some great success lowering people's blood pressure. Now to give you a quick little summary of what high blood pressure is. Uh, normal blood pressure is usually around below between 100 and uh, well between 100 uh, 100 and 139 is considered to be normal tensive unless you've got diabetes and then they'll put it down to maybe up to 130 um, but typically you want blood pressure around 120 over 80 that's good if you're at 140 over let's say 85 or 90 then that would be considered to be mild high blood pressure and mild hypertension would be somewhere between 120 and 140, moderate to 160 to 180, and then severe is over 180. Uh, I've had patients who've come in who've had blood pressure over 200, uh, not a lot of them, and you know that's a kind of a, a scarier zone. There's sometimes it's, you know, it's very scary, other times it's not. Um, but you learn all about that more in detail. So I've had if someone comes in with really severe blood pressure, I definitely want to get them, recommend they see their doctor and get on some medication because the natural therapies can be can work, but from a lawsuit legal standpoint, uh, if they were to have a stroke and I just told them to you know drink some pomegranate juice or something, um, I could I could get myself into trouble. So I've certainly had people come in with blood pressure 165 over uh, let's say 100 and 
encourage them to exercise, get them to eat some specific foods that lower blood pressure, and um, maybe take a supplement um, like CoQ10, which isn't herb, but it's good for lowering blood pressure. And that combination often has an effective effect, uh, often is beneficial in lowering blood pressure. I've had, had people go from 160, and then, and then after two or three months of changing their diet and lifestyle, their blood pressure starts bumping around 120 to 130, 120 over 80 to 135 over um, over 90 or 85 as well. So that's like a 30 or 40 point drop, uh, but it takes a few months. And so. You want to remove sugar from the person's diet. Uh, you want to get them to exercise. Obviously, no smoking is never a good idea. Um, and then here's a list of foods that have research to support the fact that they uh, lower blood pressure. So, again, olive oil is good. Also, olive leaf, which has a lot of the same active ingredients as olive oil. It's not so much the oil itself that's good for people. Like, it's not the omega 9 that have the major blood pressure lowering effect. It's what's dissolved in the olive oil. The olive oil acts as a solvent and has these various phenolic compounds and also some compounds, um, different terpenoids that have some blood pressure and, and anti inflammatory effects. Pomegranate uh, also has some uh, good research to show it helps lower blood pressure. Um, that red color you see in the pomegranate is also similar types of compounds you find in berries uh, and that they have a they're called anthocyanins and they have a a, a a mild blood pressure lowering effect celery has also been used historically as a diuretic in the lower blood pressure and there's at least one small clinical trial to support that uh, green tea has some mild blood pressure lowering effects as well so getting someone to have a couple cups of tea a day uh, might be good and then garlic uh, it, a lot of the aged garlic extracts have been shown to have a blood pressure lowering effect. And many of these work by different mechanisms. Uh, some of them can help act as a diuretic to get rid of that extra interstitial uh, fluid that's floating around. Some of them target enzymes like the angiogensin converting enzyme. So there are drugs called ACE inhibitors and some of these herbs that we have also act as ACE inhibitors. Uh, there are drugs that work um, that they block the calcium channels uh, that are involved in causing uh, constriction of the arteries. Um, and so calcium channel blockers is another class of anti, um, anti-hypertensive drugs. And some of the herbs will have that mechanism. And some of them can also help to break up, decrease sympathetic tone. So something that's sympatholytic uh, will kind of decrease the effects of epinephrine, norepinephrine in the body. And epinephrine, norepinephrine have that, has that vasoconstricting effect. So. So hibiscus shown on the left. Did I even include that in the list there? No, I didn't. You sh I'm just going to put it in there right now just because I didn't put it in there. So hibiscus is a nice Sorry about that. So hibiscus tea, you can buy it, um, you can buy it at health food stores. It originates, uh, certainly you find it more in the tropics, so in Mexico, the Caribbean, Africa, um, uh, Ethiopian restaurants uh, or stores I've seen sell it. Uh, basically, hibiscus is in, the, it's in the same family as marshmallow, and the those flowers that you see there, uh, are often used in a tea and they're rich in those anthocyanin and nice red pigments that you see also in things like berries and pomegranate juice. Both of these can be used. The challenge with pomegranates is although they're great, uh, drinking a lot of pomegranate juice has a lot of sugar and that can have a negative effect. So uh, a little bit of pomegranate juice I think is good but too much could, increase, could spike your blood sugar and be uh, an issue in excess for people with diabetes and trying to lose weight. So Roselle um, drinking hibiscus tea, it's, they also call it sour tea, it might be a better option because it doesn't have uh, significant amounts of sugar in it. So, And they both um, have similar mechanism of actions. I know that they both have some ACE inhibiting effects. Celery shown on the left, I often encourage people to uh, cut up a stalk of celery, uh, add it to water, keep it in the fridge and have 
three stocks celery day uh, with their lunch or their or their dinner, and that can help. Uh, another thing that can help lower blood pressure. Uh, green tea shown on the right. Um, that's what it looks like in the wild. Uh, the leaves of the plants basically picked and dried, and then you pour hot water, and it makes for a lovely little beverage. And although it has caffeine, it doesn't have that overly stimulating effect on the cardiovascular system. Um, there's a bunch of studies that show olives have some calcium channel blocking effects. Uh, so olive oil will have a bit of a calcium channel blocking effect. We know that um, some of the anthocyanins in uh, hibiscus block the angiotens angiotensin converting enzyme. And then finally, green tea contains flavonoids called cat like catechin that basically works on the renin system. And that's another thing we didn't even discuss that. So the point is, is these will target a lot of the same receptors that the drugs work, drugs will target. But what I like about them, in addition to decreasing blood pressure, they have this antioxidant effect and anti-inflammatory effect, which I think is great. So here's a few different, uh, another little illustration of how uh, some of the receptors uh, that can target uh, blood pressure. And as you know, epinephrine increases the influx of calcium channels and it kind of uh, has a vasoconstricting effect. So that's not a drug that has a positive effect on blood pressure, it has a negative effect. Now, another term, there's not a lot of drugs that have this effect, but there's something called the sympatholytic effect. So there's the sympathomimics, which mimics the sympathetic nervous system. And now we're talking about a sympatholytic, which breaks apart or lyses the uh, sympathetic tone. And there's one herb in particular that I'll mention that does this, and that's for Wolfie. And it's a herb that comes from uh, Ayurvedic medicine. I've only used it a couple times in my career, and it's a very potent herb. And it acts, I would classify it more having very, more like a complex drug that does have some side effects. And in traditional Ayurvedic medicine, it was used for lower blood pressure, it was also used for anxiety, um, it was also used for schizophrenia and, and people suffering from insanity. And the way that this works is it inhibits the storage of epinephrine and norepinephrine, but also dopamine. And excess amounts of dopamine can cause people to become a little bit delusional and psychotic. Uh, and certainly there's a theory that excess dopamine uh, is responsible for things like um, schizophrenia along with serotonin levels can affect that as well. But um, So what happens is with Rorolfia, this plant, when you take it in, over time, it inhibits the storage of epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And so what that means is if you can't put it into its storage vesicle, vesicles, it'll slowly be broken down by um, various enzymes, um, like monoamine oxidase enzyme, um, and it'll inactivate these things. So it depletes the overall levels or decreases the levels of epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine in the body. And so you, you've become more relaxed. Uh, but uh, there are some significant side effects associated with it, in, in particular if you take these things uh, in the drug form. The whole herb contains a few different phytochemicals that help to reduce the side effects, but taken alone, it has some significant side effects for sure. So let's see if we have some questions here. It's 10.35, perfect time for a break. Uh, so I'm going to look at the questions here. Uh, Anna says, so and is asking, sorry, just trying to piece this together. If someone is on the birth control pill, would you not recommend them taking antithrombotic herbs? Or would you more recommend them taking antithrombotic herbs? So, if someone was taking the birth control pill, uh, there is a slight increased risk of having blood clots. And I don't see any harm whatsoever with them taking an antithrombotic herb and it might actually be beneficial for them. More importantly, don't smoke when you're on the birth control pill, but uh, drinking lots of water, staying active, 
and possibly drinking some ginger tea or some eat, making sure you're taking maybe garlic on a daily basis might help to lower the risk. I haven't seen any research that says that, but I wouldn't be surprised if it does. So, um, so I've never actually gone out of my way to recommend that. But you know, telling someone it's on the birth control pill to drink ginger may not be a bad idea. Uh, I can't see a lot of any harm doing that. Um, Owen's asking me, for the final, would you ask something like, as an antithrombotic, willow axon A, PFA receptor, B, COX-1 enzyme, C, thromboxane synthetase, D, none of the above. Um, I don't think I'm going to ask anything that detailed uh, because I'm introducing some pretty complex stuff early on. I might say something like herbs that lower blood pressure could, uh, or herbs that thin the blood could act on um, PFA receptor, COX-1, and thromboxane synthetase. So I might act a more general than that, like just to know that those terms exist and that they're associated with let's say reducing blood pressure or, or decreasing the formation of clots but I don't think I'm going to go into that much detail okay um, that's a little bit more advanced I think if I did and I'd, I'm pretty sure I didn't um, if I did it wouldn't be very many questions like that it might be like one question for that's that detail okay um, uh, with regards to, so Anna's asking, with regards to sympatholytic, what do you mean when you say lyses the sympathetic tone? So lice means to break apart in Latin or whatever, whatever language it is. And so when you have increased sympathetic tone, it means that there's more epinephrine and norepinephrine floating around. So it's kind of like if you drink a cup of coffee, you're going to stimulate sympathetic tone. And so if you're trying to sedate someone and lower blood pressure and, and do these various things, then uh, I'm just saying a, sympath, um, a sympatholytic, lytic means to lice, and so that's why I'm saying lice help to break apart the sympathetic tone. That's all that I meant by that. I'm just trying to use the word. Uh, you're welcome, Owen. So any other questions? If not, we'll take a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back. checking so let's come back at 10 right now it's 1039 on my clock so let's come back at uh, 1050 so we'll take an 11 minute break and continue then okay see you soon
Who said? Who said? Say hi. Say hello. Say hello. Clap your hands. Clap your hands. Clap your hands. That's right. There you go. That's the flower. That's flax. See mommy. You gotta see mommy. I gotta start soon. Okay, say bye bye. Say bye bye, Lexi. Say bye bye. Hey, say bye bye. Say bye bye.
Okay, I'm back. So that's my daughter, Lexi. She's a sweetie. And Owen says so she's adorable, and Megan wants me to bring her to breaks more often because she's pretty cute. She is pretty cute. Um, it's one advantage of being able to lecture from home, uh, or lecture from the clinic anyways, is we can do this easily. Uh, okay. So any other questions before I get started here? Got a couple seconds longer. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so with reproduction, I'm mostly going to be start. I think I'm going to be exclusively talking about female reproduction, and I think this is an area um, that naturopaths treat a lot of female conditions, and I think herbs and diet are well suited for this. Um, a lot of women are put on the birth control pill much sooner than they need to be. I think there are some cases where women can benefit from being on it. I think it's if you want to take it for uh, contraceptive reasons, that's your own choice. They're relatively low risk. The newer, or sorry, the the older types of hormones, they, they give rel relatively low doses. Doses. I don't tend to trust any new drugs just because um, the new synthetic hormones. I just don't think they've been around long enough, but in general, I don't really like people being on sort of hormonal therapies long term, and that's the primary treatment for a lot of reproductive issues. Um, now, with herbal actions in general, we've already discussed phytoestrogens. Uh, I would say that consuming a diet high in phytoestrogens generally helps reduce the risk of women having menstrual pains. And I would say just a plant-based diet in general. Certainly we know that a vegetarian type of diet uh, lowers the risk of having uh, most women who, who are vegetarians, if they're good vegetarians and they're actually eating vegetables as opposed to the vegetarians that don't eat vegetables and they just eat pasta and uh, you know, fake uh, uh, veggie dogs and stuff like that exclusively. Um, that's not going to be uh, uh, as healthy for them for sure, but if you're eating a diet rich in fruits and vegetables and plant-based uh, proteins, you're going to naturally have a lot more anti-inflammatory and phytoestrogens in your diet. Now, in particular, both soy and flax have high amounts of phytoestrogens, and there are different types of phytoestrogens. Soy contains isoflavones, and uh, flax has lignans that have a phytoestrogenic effect. Um, and the way that these guys will work is they'll modulate the estrogen receptor and help to balance it a bit. So uh, if your estrogen levels are a little too high, let's say a woman's uh, hormones are a little out of whack and she's in her reproductive years, it may help to modulate that effect. Um, these can also benefit women if they're going through menopausal hot flashes. So if they have low levels of estrogen, uh, it can kind of boost it up a bit. And I've described this, I think, in, in, in the intro lecture. It has this modulating effect on the system. So soy and flax uh, both might benefit women who have severe menstrual cramps where you're getting a lot of, uh, might be due to excess estrogens, and it might also help with deficiencies. And in men, it can also help uh, with the prostate gland, and so some of these things can lower the risk of prostate cancer and also lower the risk of getting uh, benign prostate hyperplasia or in the large prostate. So although the term is a little sexist saying phytoestrogen, it should probably be just phy phyto uh, sex hormone, Nick but it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, so they will have some balancing effects on other hormones other than just estrogen, and the problem I don't like the term phytoestrogenic is that it implies that it has a stimulatory effect exclusively on the estrogen levels. And although these have some of that those effects, they also have a modulating effect uh, and can kind of decrease them as well. Um, so these act as a partial agonist and can basically decrease the overall effects of estrogen in the body. 
one thing you want to be careful with is someone's on uh, some type of, let's say, chemotherapy like tamoxifen um, or other types of chemotherapies that are basically blocking estrogen in the body. You would want to be cautious about giving them flax or soy in high amounts because it could interfere with the efficacy and, and decrease the efficacy of the, uh, of the drug. So on the left hand side you see flax, that's what the flower looks like, it's quite pretty, it's small, delicate, um, and then on the right is what the seed looks like. And I typically eat flax seed every day for breakfast with what I have for breakfast is um, about a cup and a cup and a half of fruit. And then I'll have two tablespoons of ground total, two tablespoons of, or maybe three tablespoons, uh, which contains ground flax ground chia and hemp nut in equal parts and then I'll throw the walnuts uh, about six or eight walnuts on top of that and so what I'm getting with that is if I'm eating the berries or I think this morning I had papaya usually I like having berries is that they're rich in antioxidants and then the chia and the flax are rich in omega-3s and also rich in fiber that fiber is also good for balancing hormones because it helps uh, keep the bowels working uh, readily early and, and helps to pull estrogens out of the body. The flax contains the lignans and those lignans which have the phytoestrogenic effect also help um, lower blood pressure and they also have, are really good antioxidants and they have anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, so for men it lowers the risk of heart disease and also may lower the risk of prostate cancer um, that we know of. Uh, they also lower cholesterol because of all the fiber, helps to lower the risk of diabetes. Um, walnuts have been shown to help with Alzheimer's. They're very rich in antioxidants and, and various phenolic compounds that are beneficial. Um, so that's my breakfast and I think it's like a miracle breakfast, all vegan breakfast. And uh, uh, it probably has the equivalent of six to eight servings of fruits and vegetables. Uh, when you look at all the phytochemicals. And just as an aside, what interests me about nutrition is obviously you need the macronutrients, the protein, the fat, the carbohydrates to some degree. Um, obviously it's good to have the vitamins and the minerals to make your body work better. So those are those essential nutrients you need. When it comes to the non-essential nutrients, these are all the phytochemicals, all the flavonoids that help reduce the risk of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and everything else. Um, and uh, it's really important to get more of these in the diet and eating a plant-based diet even though I eat meat I have no problems eating this weekend I had lobster and I had steak and I had uh, chicken and I had sausages you know I ate lots of different things but I still make sure I always eat lots and lots of um, plant material and vegetables um, so flax I think it's one of those superfoods you should all eat it it's um, inexpensive just make sure you grind it to release those active ingredients now this is a neat little study is some people are like saying oh phytoestrogens they could increase your risk of breast cancer that's not good what's interesting is here's a study that basically shows that not only I gotta move sorry you can't see this but I just gotta move something <clears throat> this was a study that they looked at flax in a systematic review uh, and basically this study found that it reduces the risk of uh, primary breast cancer for 18 uh, percent. It also improves mood because these lignans have some uh, effect on neurotransmitters and, and um, elevated mood by 24 percent and lowered overall risk of mortality by 31 percent and that's pretty cool. So flax, just looking at fl flax and breast cancer it uh, it lowers the risk and it decreases the risk of dying and it makes people feel better so and improves their depression and their mood so um, if someone tells you that you shouldn't take breast or shouldn't take flax uh, if you've got breast cancer or you're at risk uh, you can show them this study and see if that changes their opinion and often doctors when they hear about phytoestrogens they say nope don't give it to women who've got breast cancer or at risk and I would say you know what based on this systematic review that's good evidence I would give it to women who have uh, breast cancer or at least 
let them make the decision and give them this evidence. Uh, here's another study that showed, um, what was this one? Just another study showing that the uh, lignans and flax lower the risk of breast cancer. And also with uh, soy products also lower the risk. <clears throat> so another um, Another type of action that's sort of unique to, uh, I think, herbal medicine are uterine tonics. Again, we talked about digestive tonics, bitter tonics, um, a cardio tonic. Here's a uterine tonic. Now, when you think about the uterus, it's a muscle that, like any muscle in the body, you want to keep it relatively toned. <clears throat> and um, to sort of simplify it and make it a little bit silly, if you have really strong uterine contractions, <clears throat> that's like too much. That's like hypertonicity. That's too much, and that causes pain. If you have too little tone, then what happens is <clears throat> the uterus is too relaxed, and that could maybe maybe it's not able to contract to stop bleeding. <clears throat> or if a woman has really poor uterine tone, it could cause a prolapse uterus, where literally the uterus falls down uh, and can actually uh, come out of the vaginal, uh, like come right out of the body and sort of be have a prolapse uterus <clears throat> because it lacks that tone. Or if the uterus doesn't have a lot of tone and you're pregnant, what happens is, I don't know if this is true or not, but maybe it just can't keep the baby in place. It doesn't have that tone to keep everything where it's supposed to and it increases the risk of having a miscarriage. So uterine tonics would be used for most female types of conditions and some of these are going to be safe to use uh, when women are pregnant and other ones will not be used, will not be safe for during pregnancy. So um, Don Quiet, Blue Co-Wash, Black Co-Wash, I would say these aren't really safe herbs to give during um, pregnancy. Maybe Don Quiet is. Um, historically these have been used uh, during pregnancy if women were uh, to help with during the third trimester, help with the delivery, uh, or maybe to increase tone or help to regulate the uterus. But because these can stimulate uterine contractions and increase the tone, there is the risk that they could cause a miscarriage. Not to mention both blue and black cohosh. Some of the phytochemicals could have uh, some negative effects on the uterus or on the, uh, the developing fetus. So you definitely do not want to use these throughout the trimester. And I would say I'd be very cautious about using it in the third trimester, especially in high doses, because there is risks associated with this. And there are case reports of um, infants being harmed by it. Um, now on the left-hand side, this is Don Kwai. Don Kwai is also called Angelica sinensis. <clears throat> now this is in the same family, uh, it's in the APACA family of plants. And that's the same family that includes things like fennel, anise, and also things like celery. Now, the compounds that you find in Don Kwai, there are a number of phenolic compounds we'll talk about later on. There's also some, some uh, compounds called phthalides that mimic the same types of ones that you'll get in celery. And so what's interesting is celery has a vasodilating effect and so does Don Kwai. Both these herbs um, relax smooth muscles and sort of have that effect. So with a woman who has at the uterine tone is too strong and they're and it's uh, and it's they're getting a lot of menstrual cramps then I think it can modulate that and help to sort of normalize and have an antispasmodic effect on on the uterus to relax it a bit and so it's in Chinese medicine it's considered to be uh, kind of that primary archetypal herb used for uh, female complaints it does not in my opinion have significant phytoestrogenic effects it's acting more as a smooth muscle relaxant and as an antispasmodic, and that's how it works. <clears throat> now, even though it's considered to be a female herb, it sometimes is given to men for cardiovascular complaints because of the vaso, because of this, it relaxes smooth muscles. It also has a vasodilating effect, and so you'll often see it in men's formulas that have for angina uh, or to lower blood pressure. Don Quai is sometimes used that, and the reason why I'm making the parallels with celery is that although celery is not as potent. Um, it does have sort of 
they're cousins of each other and I could see there being some potential similarities and possibly and I don't know but possibly celery if you consume it in your diet on a regular basis uh, because of the diuretic effect and because it has a bit of a um, um, antispasmodic effect and anti-inflammatory effect I'm quite certain it would help women with um, with um, pretty bad menstrual cramps. Now, Don, uh, sorry, black cohosh on the right hand side. Um, this is a North American uh, plant uh, first discovered and first used by the indigenous people of North America and Canada, uh, Canada and the US. Uh, you'll find this growing in the wild and the forest still, it's quite common. I don't use it uh, a lot in practice. Uh, it's not a herb I use on a daily basis, but I do use it for women who um, do have menstrual complaints. Sometimes I'll use it for hot flashes. It um, has some anti-inflammatory effects. It does affect various hormones in the body like luteinizing hormone and uh, uh, follicular stimulating hormone. Uh, so LH and FSH, we know it has an effect on that. Uh, it may bounce hormones a bit. Um, I don't know exactly the mechanism, it's kind of a little bit complicated, uh, but my advice would be if you're going to use something like that, with a lot of these uterine tonics, is you need to be on them for uh, probably around two or three months before you can really evaluate if it's helping or not. Um, so black co-wash, uh, I definitely would not give this to a woman who's trying to conceive though. Now a uterine astringent, we've already talked about astringent herbs and how they uh, help tighten up the mucous membranes and decrease bleeding. A uterine astringent is something that would be given to a woman who's experiencing really heavy menstrual flow or if they're exper experiencing, let's say, postpartum hemorrhaging, so after they've had uh, a baby and uh, it causes a lot of trauma to the area. And so um, taking some herbs that basically help to, to, to heal up the wounds and, and to stop the bleeding uh, would be indicated. Uh, and then also for, for women that they're suffering from a uterine prolapse. Um, so there are a number of herbs that can be used. Shepherd's purse on the left hand side is often used in traditional herbal medicine. Um, I've used it a few times with mixed results. Uh, it's often indicated for fibroids and so a fibroid is a benign tumor that women can get on their uterus that can increase uh, bleeding. Um, and shepherd's purse can be is used historically for that. So is bethroot. Bethroot, which is trillium, you probably have heard of it. Uh, it's the um, what do you call that? The it's the the flower of Ontario. I forget what you call that. Um, and so trillium, although it's I think it's illegal to pick it, or maybe it's maybe it's not. I don't know if it's conserve uh, if it's there's some kind of conservation because it's the uh, uh, it's on the Ontario flag. Um, bethroot the root itself is quite astringent and so it's a great uterine tonic for women that are suffering from excess menstrual bleeding. Um, and you could also be used it topically and internally uh, for the same medication that you might use witch hazel or, or oak bark. So I know it's also been used for things like diarrhea um, and bleeding and but it has an affinity for the for the uh, uh, for the uterus. Um, Anti-hemorrhagic, so this basically is used to stop hemorrhaging. So postpartum hemorrhaging, so after a woman's had um, a baby, also very severe menstrual cramps where it's, you're seeing a lot of heavy blood, so it's something called menorrhagia, um, you might use these herbs as well. Same ones that we talked about, the uterine tonics um, and shepherd's purse. Many of the anti-hemorrhagic herbs are astringent, a uterine ton, a uh, uterine um, uh, astringents, but um, not all of them are. There are certain ones, uh, for example, the ergot fungus, which contains ergotamine. That's a, been isolated and used as a drug uh, that causes really severe uh, uterine contractions, and it works by a different mechanism. It's not an astringent. It actually works by um, binding, um, modulating serotonin, certain serotonin receptors involved with bleeding. So um, historically ergot fungus was used for, for postpartum hemorrhages. Now there are, are drugs you can use that are safer and more predictable so they tend to be used more but um, 
these work by different mechanism than the um, stringent herbs. Now, another term is an amenagogue. So an amenagogue is a substance that helps to induce and regulate menstruation. So this might be used for a woman who has, uh, I've used amenagogues with patients if they haven't had a period, um, often when women discontinue, uh, discontinue taking the birth control pill, it can take over a year um, before their menstrual cycle sort of comes back. So they may not have a period for over a year because their body gets all confused. It's used to having a drug, uh, sorry, a hormone in place, uh, an exogenous hormone that's sort of regulating things. And, uh, and then you discontinue, it doesn't really know what to do. So amenagogues can be used to stimulate uterine contractions to get blood flow um, occurring. Uh, it can also be used when women sort of have erratic menstrual cycles uh, and also they're only bleeding a little bit, which may not be a bad thing, but uh, they want to normalize um, the, the menstrual cycle in the period that the menagogues would be given. And so herbs like black cohosh, blue cohosh, parsley have all been used for that purpose. Um, they have other indications as well. So parsley is a classic one um, that has been used as an amenagogue. And there are lots of other herbs. I'm only just mentioning a, a few of them. Uh, there is blue cohosh on the left-hand side and parsley like the spice that you get or the vegetable or the herb, whatever you want to call it, that you find in like tabbouleh and cooking. Uh, it's, a, it's a good amenagogue. Um, now, high, high amounts of any type of amenagogue has the risk of having an abortifacient effect because if you start stimulating uterine contraction when a woman's pregnant, that could be have a negative effect. So um, I'm not really too concerned about having a little bit of tabbouleh with dinner. You're not going to suddenly have a miscarriage if you're pregnant. But I wouldn't go and have a big bowl full of parsley, um, like a salad just with pure parsley every single day because it could have some negative effects um, when you're pregnant. So caution with that. And blue cohosh, again, has a menagogue effect. Uh, so it's actually been used in the third trimester to help induce labor. Um, and certainly midwives and naturopaths have used it for that purpose. But there are a number of case reports of it causing uh, some complications. So we'll talk about that more a little bit during the safety lecture. So um, I wouldn't recommend it without getting informed consent from your patient just because there are risks associated with it. So as I mentioned, abortifacient basically is used to terminate the pregnancy. Um, this is a huge ethical issue, but all you know, ethics and morals and everything aside, I would not, even if I was pro-choice, I don't think I would want to be using abortifacient herbs to try to terminate a pregnancy uh, because they're not very predictable and you don't want to not do this properly uh, if you're going to be doing that. So um, so herbs like pennyroyal, uh, which is a member of the mint family, it was used historically as an abortifacient, as sort of the archetypal one. And um, there's even a song by Nirvana called Penny Royalty. Um, and so it certainly is toxic. It's uh, it's a teratogen, which means it, it kind of has, it destroys or can disrupt the uh, growth of the baby. And teratogen basically means, genesis means to make, terato means monster. So basically you make little monsters. So you're messing around with the DNA and the way the, uh, the baby is forming. So Penny Royal is definitely not something you want to be drinking if you're pregnant. Um, and I don't know how effective it is, but I, you want to be careful with it. Also, blue cohosh, again, although it has been used uh, historically in the third trimester, um, you there, if you want to keep your baby, you wouldn't want to use it in the first or second trimester at all. It wouldn't be a good idea. And then finally, parsley, as I mentioned already. This is going to be dose dependent, so don't worry if you eat a little bit of parsley that was on your you know, poached salmon uh, or a little bit in your tabbouleh. It's not going to have a negative effect, um, but don't overdo it with that. So a lot of these abortifacients could work by 
uh, stimulating uterine contractions. They're acting as a menagogues, or it may just be a toxic substance uh, that interferes with the fetus. A lot of the time now, methotrexate, which inhibits folic acid, uh, the effects of folic acid is generally used uh, as abortifacients in by conventional means. Um, and it's pretty effective. Uh, there's some other things that they use as well. So generally speaking, um, I think it's better to be aware of what the abortifacient herbs are um, so you don't accidentally give them to a woman who's pregnant. And in general, I think it's wise just never give anything to a woman unless you, who's pregnant unless you know it's safe. I'd rather err on the side of caution. Um, now, we talked about phytoestrogens and how they can balance hormones. Uh, there are also herbs called hormo hormone regulators uh, that balance estrogen levels, but they're not actually working directly on the estrogen receptor. And I didn't go into this in a lot of detail. But um, so when you think of flax and soy, it'll modulate and compete with estrogens floating around the body to have its effect there. There's a classic herb called chase tree, or it's also referred to as vitex. And this is one of my favorite hormone regulators. And so it's used for menstrual complaints, for PMS, also for breast tenderness. And the way that it works is it modulates um, the release of hormones in the body by working uh, at the anterior pituitary, or at the pituitary gland, the anterior pituitary gland, posterior, anterior, I can't remember now, it's been a while since I thought about that. Um, and so what happens is at the pituitary gland, there are receptors for dopamine there. And so dopamine, under normal circumstances, dopamine, or I guess it's not, dopamine has two main effects in the body. One, it acts as a neurotransmitter, and it's the same neurotransmitter that gets released when you do cocaine or you smoke or you gamble or you look at too much pornography, all those things that people get hooked on and addicted to uh, involve dopamine, including coffee. And so it increases focus. It can have a, uh, a positive effect on mood within normal amounts, but it also causes um, sort of addiction. Um, but outside of the central nervous system, has an antagonistic effect, a relationship with prolactin. And prolactin um, is one of the hormones that stimulates milk production, and it also has a stimulatory effect on, um, you know, breast tissue and, and in general, women who suffer from PMS where they get a lot of breast tenderness are likely to have elevated uh, prolactin levels. And so, what Vitex appears to do is that rather than targeting the estrogen receptors, it actually modulates the dopamine receptors. Uh, and so when dopamine receptors are stimulated, it lowers prolactin levels. And so it has this modulating effect where, like phytoestrogens, it balances it. It seems to balance the dopamine receptors and the D2 ones involved with uh, affecting various hormones. So when it binds there, it will indirectly have, to, well, it'll have an effect on uh, FSH, a luteinizing hormone, that then will have an effect on estrogen and progesterone. And so often books will say that uh, this helps to elevate progesterone. So you can use things like Vitex for women that have low progesterone. Um, you can use it for women that have breast tenderness from having hyperprolactinemia or elevated prolactin, prolactin levels. Um, prolactin levels. Um, but I would also say that if you look at the historical indications, what's interesting about the herb Vitex is it's called chase tree. And the reason why they call it chase tree is because it was once given to monks to lower libido. And so monks who don't really have an outlet for their, for their libido, their prolactin or their um, dopamine levels uh, can become high. And in men, Prolactin and dopamine levels also have an antagonistic relationship, but when men have an erection and after they ejaculate, prolactin gets released and causes men to lose their erections and they have that refractory period where they can't have sex for a period of time, and that's due to uh, the release of prolactin. And if they have too much dopamine, then dopamine acts as 
an aphrodisiac or a, a, a sexual stimulant in men. Uh, so with the monks, if they took a uh, chase tree or, or Vitex, uh, it would modulate those dopamine receptors to slightly elevate the prolactin levels and that would lower libido in, in the men. So on one hand it's used for men with I guess high libido where they don't have an outlet for it. It's also been used in some cases to help with male fertility because I don't think it only suppresses uh, um, uh, dopamine levels. I think it actually has a modulating effect where if your prolactin levels are too low, it brings it up. If it's too high, it brings it down. And you also see this when it comes to women. So historically, Vitex is backed up with research to show that it helps to decrease prolactin levels and have a, uh, uh, a beneficial effect for women who develop PMS, in particular breast tenderness. So when we get a lot of breast tenderness, it's usually because they have elevated prolactin levels indirectly related to an excess of estrogen floating around in the body. And so uh, it kind of helps to modulate and lower estrogen and maybe increase uh, progesterone levels and decrease the prolactin levels. So in women, it can be given for breast tenderness to lower prolactin levels. It's also been used historically for women who aren't producing enough milk. And so it's actually been used to stimulate prolactin levels and increase milk production. So it has this sort of conflicting sort of uh, indications where how can it be used when there's too much prolactin and, and it can also be used when there's not enough prolactin. How can it be used to increase libido but it can also be used to decrease libido. Um, and it's all about having that modulating effect on the dopamine receptor that indirectly will affect prolactin levels and have a normalizing effect. Um, what I love about Vitex is the fact that I don't really do any lab work to find out if a woman's high in estrogen or low in progesterone or whatever it is. I find that the nice thing about Vitex is it tends to work really well in formulas. I might combine it with some other herbs, but even if I don't know precisely what's going on, it tends to normalize things, which is nice. So. If a woman has menstrual complaints, uh, I've used it for um, breast tenderness and it works well. Uh, I've also used it in formulas with it, usually in a menagog as well. For women who, let's say, if they haven't had their period after going off the birth control pill, I've seen uh, formulas that contain Vitex as a primary herb with maybe uh, some black cohosh and another herb in it. Um, typically, within one month, I'll usually see spotting will appear and then by the second or third month they start getting the nor normal period again and I'll continue them on it for about four or five or maybe six months uh, depending on how they're presenting um, and it helps to get the period back on track. So I've had lots of successful cases with it. Uh, one thing I've found is if you discontinue it too early, like you give it for one month and then you stop it, uh, usually that's not enough time for it to work. So in general my little advice for any kind of hormonal thing, whether it's menstrual cramps or hormonal acne or um, um, breast tenderness or anything like that, um, you typically want to give the treatment for at least two or three months before you can evaluate it because hormones take two to three months uh, to, to really have a significant effect. So that's Vitex. So there is a picture of it there. Vitex grows in the tropics or not tropics. Um, it can grow, it actually can grow up here as well. It's often cultivated. I remember when I was uh, in Rome, uh, it's a common tree that grows in the city. Uh, uh, there's a couple of them that grow around the Colosseum in, in uh, Rome. When I was down in Cuba, I noticed it was an ornamental tree growing on along the side of the road there. Um, it grows quite large. It's a pretty tree. Um, we have one in the herb garden. Um, I think they they may have drastically trimmed it, but uh, the leaves look an, a little bit like marijuana leaves. It, it doesn't actually, uh, that's about the only similarities. But if you're looking at it, it does kind of look like marijuana. Um, and it produces, you'll see that's the flower there, and it produces little seeds at the top there um, that are about the size of peppercorns. And uh, that's the primary thing that's used. Now another, uh, another term um, 
we mentioned that Vitex, it has been used historically for um, the increased milk production. The classic term uh, is galactagog. Galactagogs are substances that are usually given to women that are nursing to help with their milk supply. And so this is used primarily for breastfeeding. Um, herbs like, I didn't list them all, even herbs uh, like dill and fennel, which women can uh, easily drink as a tea or, or have, add some dill to your salad. It seems to increase milk production. Certainly my wife was saying the other day that she notices that um, when she's eating dill with her salad, it seems to help improve her, her uh, milk production. Some other herbs are fenugreek and blessed thistle. These have been used historically uh, to increase milk production as well. So lots of different options out there. Different people have different formulas, for, um, various teas to increase milk production. Um, another thing, just as a side, if a woman's not producing enough milk, what's the most important thing, uh, in my opinion, uh, the most important thing in my opinion to increase milk production is drinking lots of water. Because if you're producing, you know, you're basically producing milk for, uh, for the baby, if you're not drinking enough fluids, you're just not gonna have enough water available to make the milk. So there's a major hormonal component, but you, you gotta drink tons and tons of milk. And I find that most women that are trying to have issues with breastfeeding, they're probably not making enough milk. Uh, sorry, they're probably not drinking enough uh, water. Uh, fenugreek, just as an aside, it's also been used for other hormonal complaints like menstrual cramps uh, as well. So uh, it's not just isolated just to, uh, to galactagogues. Also fenugreek, you'll see that it's sometimes used as a herb for natural breast, uh, what's it called, Augment, augmentation. Uh, so some women will take fenugreek seeds if they want to increase their bust size. I don't know of any double blind clinical trials uh, that have uh, you know proven it works, but certainly anecdotally, some women claim it it, it has that effect. So um, you know, just putting that out there for whatever reason. Um, We've already talked about antispasmodics when we're describing the digestive tract, the respiratory tract. When it comes to uh, the female reproductive system, you use antispasmodic herbs specifically. Oh, my daughter's screaming in the backyard. Uh, back here, uh, background. Um, use antispasmodic herbs, also spasmolytic, same thing, uh, for menstrual cramps. So anytime there's cramping of the smooth muscles, there are a few archetypal herbs used for that. We've already talked about Don Quai and Black Cohosh. These are uterine tonics. They also have an antispasmodic effect. Um, I would probably be inclined to use these um, more on a daily basis for a few months to try to balance the hormones and have that antispasmodic effect. Well, cramp bark, which is shown on the left-hand side, this is by Burnham Opulus. Um, this is a herb I've used acutely in high doses, uh, maybe a day before the woman's period, uh, and while she's uh, menstruating, I might have her take anywhere between you know, a couple teaspoons of tincture, and I might even go as high as ten, you know, uh, maybe five or six teaspoons in a day if the cramping is very severe. Some people, some women, I find think it's it's a great tool that. Uh, taken acutely in high doses can really help uh, with menstrual cramps. Uh, so definitely worth trying. Uh, it's available as a tea, it just doesn't taste very good as well. Uh, not that the tincture tastes any better, but uh, so cramp bark is a great one I find for using it acutely for menstrual cramps. I think that's it. So do you guys have some questions for me? We're done. The we're done that. You guys still there? Any comments, questions?